Good afternoon. So good to see you all today. Welcome to our Young Males of Color Forum, Creating a Pathway to Success. I'm Mark L. Quarles, and I'm, I'm going to not be up here before you too long, but I want to introduce the person who's going to officially welcome you, Dr. Wallace, our Vice President for Student Affairs. Dr. Wallace began his appointment at CSUB in February of 2012. Um, he's held administrative and faculty positions at the University of Mississippi and University of Nebraska, Omaha. He's Vice President for Student Affairs, Associate Professor of Education Emeritus, also at the University of Mississippi. Um, Dr. Walsh is also a noted lecturer and facilitator on topics of, such as diversity, leadership development, and student recruitment and retention. He served on the executive board of the Phi Kappa Alpha Honorary Society, held the position of Mississippi Director of the National Association of School Personnel Administrators, otherwise known as NASPA, for four years and also served as a faculty member on the Mississippi Economic Council Leadership Mississippi Program, the country's second oldest state leadership program. Dr. Walsh received his Bachelor of Arts in edu Elementary Education, Master of Arts in Education Administration, and Doctor of Philosophy in Educational Leadership, all from the University of Mississippi. Join me in welcoming our Vice President for Student Affairs, who will welcome you today, Dr. Thomas Wallace. Thank you, Dr. Quarles. I'd like to say to all of you, we appreciate your coming out today and understanding the importance of a program such as this. And some will ask the question, why a Young Males of Color Forum? Well, let me give you a, a brief history. Uh, going back to April of this year, for the first time, the California State University system had a Young Males of Color Forum for the system. Now, of all places, when you think about 23 universities coming together for such an important event, that event was held on our campus here at CSU Bakersfield, it's something that we were very proud of. Following that, a consortium was created as part of a follow-up to the forum itself. As we look at moving forward, we have two representatives for that consortium who are here on our campus. That is Dr. Quarles and also E.J. Callahan are our two representatives to that consortium. So as a part of that, our first event that we're having on our campus is the forum today that you are a part of. And as we were thinking about how could we kick this off, what would be a wonderful way to kick it off? Who would be the individual that understands what we're trying to do, not only as a system, but what we're trying to do here at CSUB? And as we pondered names, uh, one name kept emerging over and over again. And that gentleman is sitting here, and Dr. Horace Mitchell. <laughs> So following Dr. Mitchell's uh, keynote address today, we have a group of panelists uh, that you see assembled here that you will have the opportunity to hear from and ask questions of. If you look in your seat, you will see an index card. Uh, if you have questions, please write any question you might have on the index card, and Dr. Quarles or EJ1 will get that card from you. Now, I'm giving you a welcome on behalf of the consortium. It's for you to receive a university welcome, then that should come from our fifth president, Dr. Lynette Zelesny. And what I know about Dr. Zelesny is not only is she one of those that talks about diversity and understands its value, she has made it very clear her commitment to diversity. And you can see that in her actions and the things that are going on on our campus. So it gives me privilege and honor to welcome, to do the official welcome, uh, Dr. Zelesny.
Well, a very warm welcome, and it is a real privilege to see all of you here today. Thank you for your participation in this very important event. I also want to thank our leadership, E.J. Callahan, Dr. Markel Quarles, and most especially our Vice President for Student Affairs, our wonderful Dr. Thomas Wallace. Thank you very much for the coordination of this. And panelists, let me thank you for your dedication to this issue. Just this morning, we had an important meeting with community leaders uh, on what is now called the African American Council. We also included some important leadership here at CSUB, and I want to also recognize uh, Dr. Tracy Salisbury. Thank you very much for your leadership on the black faculty and staff uh, leadership Association here at CSUB. We appreciate you very much. This morning, though, was a time for us to really publicly state our intentionality about continuing to move forward with our commitment to diversity and to particularly young males of color. And we want to be the university in the California State University system that really is going to be the destination campus for recruiting many more young men of color, and for this to be a place where you have an amazing experience. So we're so happy that you're here to hear from our amazing keynote today. It's with great pride that today I am able to introduce a true rock star. And this is a person that I have long been following, 50 years of experience and leadership in higher education, fourth president here at California State University, Bakersfield, a man who has been dedicated to diversity and inclusion throughout his career. He is the reason that CSUB has been noted nationally for inclusion. He is the reason that we were noted in the Wall Street Journal for being a place of social mobility. He's the reason that we moved into Division I and we now have this holistic program for scholar athletes. And he is the reason that you are here today to hear about his journey, to hear about his wisdom and his experience. And I am delighted to always be in the room with a man of great energy and great insight. Let me introduce to you our wonderful Dr. Horace Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, President Zelezny, for that uh, very generous introduction. Thank you. And um, I've had an opportunity uh, to be here for about almost a day and a half, uh, not quite, but uh, Dr. Zelezny hosted a dinner uh, with us uh, last night and then the breakfast this morning that she talked about. And um, I, I feel very good that Dr. Zelezny is our n new president. I say our, because, you know, <laughs> but always, but <but> as always. <laughs> and, and so uh, congratulations again, and you're really getting off to a great start. Really appreciate it. And I think uh, certainly this initiative is one that is extremely important to the system and to all of us here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Wallace and Dr. Quarles and also EJ for your leadership on this very important initiative. Um, and what we're doing in terms of uh, young males of color is very consistent with Graduation Initiative 2025. And so all of the things that we're doing for the initiative then get intensified and become more purposeful with respect to the um, young males of color. Now, my initial thought uh, for this presentation was that I would describe my uh, pathway to success uh, starting as a young male of color and I was one, I was young once. <laughs> it's been a few years. <laughs> and then I was going to describe significant factors that were important along that pathway and which have relevance for today's young uh, males of color and others as well. Uh, I decided to reverse that order. And so what I want to do is to talk really more about some of the significant factors first and then uh, describe my own experiences. Um, as a psychologist, uh, when I talk about the interface between people 
and institutions or society in general, I often start with the concept of identity construction. And when we talk about identity, very often the idea is that for each of us, our identity just happens, you know. But in fact, a number of theorists, and I agree with them, say, no, the way identity happens is that as individuals, we actually construct our identity by, for example, uh, looking at things that are happening in our environment, the behaviors of people and others, and we make statements like, okay, I'm like that, I'm not like this. I do this, I don't do that. And those kinds of statements begin to define who we are. And um, very often, it's not seen as intentional, you know, but it's what we do. And so it's important to talk about this idea of uh, identity construction. Um, for uh, young males of color, and for all of us, we're not simply what some people say, quote, products of our environment or products of our experience. And I say this because too often people think that. If you come out of a certain kind of environment, then you're gonna be this way or that way or the other way. And people sometimes ask the question, how is it that two people from the same family or the same community are so different? Well, the answer is actually quite easy. It's not the experiences that they have, which might have been exactly the same. It is rather the meanings that they give to those experiences. Okay, and that's important to know. And then the decisions that they then make about what it is that they want to do. And so you can have two people in the very same experience, and one says, you know, it means that I'm not a good person and I don't know what's going to happen. The other person says, nah, -uh. well, what's going on? It's not about me. I don't know who it's about, but that's not me because this is who I am. Okay. And during my first year as president, I taught a senior seminar in psychology on identity construction. And so what I said to students at the end of the class is that uh, an individual, such as any of the ones in the class at that point, any of us in here now, or an institution like CSUB, or a community like Bakersfield, can have an identity by default based on the perceptions of others, or we can construct our desired identity by taking proactive steps of self-definition. And, and that's exactly what we want all of our young men of color to do, to take proactive steps of self-definition, not allow somebody else to define you, but to define yourself and where it is that you're going. Um, Algerian uh, psychiatrist Franz Fanon, the author of The Wretched of the Earth, has three significant questions related to identity. The first question is, who am I? The second is, am I who I say I am? And that deals with the congruence between what one says and how one behaves. And then the third question that he poses, which is also very important, is, am I all I ought to be? Okay, very important question. Because sometimes people settle for being where they are right now, okay? And the question is, are you all you ought to be? And so what we want of the young men of color is that you, are, you become all that you ought to be, all right? And so I'm going to talk about that uh, just a bit. So um, with this uh, brief background, I want to uh, move uh, into some general themes related to uh, the development of young men of color before I talk about my own pathway. First, uh, with respect to institutional factors affecting uh, young men of color, uh, it's important uh, that institutions have a commitment to student success and graduation with an intentional focus on young males of color. 
And that's what you see happening with President Zelezny. She's saying, and then with the initiative that Dr. Wallace has talked about, and that's system-wide, that um, it's purposeful that there is a focus on young men of color because it's in that group where the gaps are the largest in terms of graduation rates and other kinds of factors. And so we need to be very intentional about that. And uh, as part of that, institutions must understand student needs and differential needs among students, as well as they need to understand the best practices related to working with students across a variety of particular circumstances. And here again, this is very much a part of the Graduation Initiative 2020. Next, universities should have supportive faculty and staff. And sometimes uh, there's a need for faculty and staff development to fully understand that. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, when I, I came to uh, CSUB as president in 2004, it was fairly clear to me that for many of our faculty, they wanted students other than the students that we enroll. Okay, uh, they wanted you know students who were more this, more that, and more the other, and did not pay enough attention to the students in our own neighborhood. And of course, over time, that changed quite significantly, and there has been a very strong um, relationship uh, between the university and the community, uh, and an understanding that we we support and graduate the students who are here, because this is what our commitment is, and that's what we'll do. Um, also, um, universities should have visible males of color, among others, as role models, mentors, and sponsors for students. And I mention uh, role models, mentors, and sponsors because uh, those are not always the same person. Uh, sometimes they are. Uh, as students, you can look at individuals in the community or in the university and say, well, you know, I want to be like that when I grow up, all right? Uh, and, but you might not have much interaction with that person, but you see that person as a role model. Then secondly is mentors. And mentors are people that you work with very directly in terms of supporting what it is that you're trying to do, guiding you, helping you to do those things that, that make a difference in your life. And then sponsors are people who are in a position to really influence or, or support certain kinds of decisions that would benefit you. Might be someone who says, you know, uh, he is just an outstanding person, and we need to give him a shot at this kind of position, you know. And, and that's something that a sponsor can do. Uh, it's a person who might recommend you for a particular role or responsibility. So on the individual level, uh, those are just, I'm sorry, on the institutional level, those are a few of the important factors. And we can get way more into detail on that. And there's a lot of work that has been done on best practices with respect to supporting student success and graduation. But we won't get into those at this point. Uh, now I want to move to thinking about uh, individual factors. That is, how it is that young men of color, and in fact all of us, can um, do things that make a difference in our lives. And there's several that I want to mention. First, uh, students, and we're, we're talking, again, primarily to the young men of color, but this is relevant for everybody because we all work with those students, these students, our students. So one is that you have to make a commitment to completing your education. And whenever I've talked, and we have uh, many members of the men's basketball team here, and thank you for being here, and thank you, Coach. And when I uh, would speak to recruits, I'd tell them very clearly, I want you to have a good athletics experience. We have outstanding coaches who can support you in that in terms of your further development as a student athlete, 
But in addition to that, we want to make sure that you graduate from the university. And uh, the uh, coaching staff and the athletics department are committed to that. And so we heard some statistics this morning which just uh, represent testaments to how well this is happening. And I want to congratulate you again, Coach, for doing such a great job in that regard. So uh, it takes, in addition to the support that we would provide, it takes your own commitment to finishing your degree. And so we, we congratulate you on that. Also, students, it's important that you always strive for excellence. Um, in everything that you do. And sometimes you're being noticed whether you know it or not, okay? And people making observations about you, drawing conclusions about you, all these kinds of things, all right? So you want to always uh, be uh, striving for success in what you do. Thirdly, you need to be proactive in exploring possible opportunities. Don't, can't just wait around for, well, and say, well, nobody told me about that. Yeah, but did you take a look at it? Did you look online? Did you uh, look at the job board in uh, CC? Did you do X, Y, or Z? All right. So uh, you need to be very purposeful in that. I can, this reminds me that several years ago I did a presentation for Project Best which is a community and university-based project for high school students. And I talked to them about this concept of being players and being pawns, okay? And so I talked about what players do, you know, actively engage, do things you need to do. And I made sure that they understood that I was talking about players and not players, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, we're talking about players. Uh, and, and the other was about pawns. You know, so pawns wait around to see what's going to happen, and players make things happen. And so we want all of you to be players and not pawns. Next, uh, it's important that you uh, extend your support and social network. Uh, this is a broad community, uh, a lot of great people, and um, you need to make sure you recognize that you are not here alone, that there are people here who are ready to be supportive of you, and, and that's important. Next, um, you need to, uh, in my opinion, uh, develop your leadership skills because uh, as you move along in life, it's not only about what you can do as an individual, it's what you can do as a member of a team and as a leader of a team. And I know we have within athletics, for example, uh, an outstanding leadership development team for student athletes. We also have outstanding leadership development programs for students in general. And so as you are coming through the university, make sure that you take the opportunity to develop your leadership skills. You know, you might say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not somebody who's a leader. Uh, I wouldn't want you to think that way, okay? And leadership is not simply about being in a leadership position. You know, I'm the president, I'm the vice president, I'm this or that. All of us from time to time take on leadership roles whether or not we have leadership positions, okay? And so always be mindful of the possibility of being able to do that. Next, it's important to pay attention to what is going on around you. You need to listen well. Uh, when we talk about communication skills, a lot of emphasis is placed on uh, speaking, and that is important, but listening is also extremely important listening in a way that you understand not only the words that people are saying, but also the affect that go along with those words that add meaning to what it is that they're saying. So uh, good listening skills are really very important. Uh, two last things. Uh, the next is 
to develop a vision for your future and a strategy to create that future. I said it's strategy to create that future. It has been said that the best way to predict the future is to create it, all right? And for all of us, including the young men of color here, we have the opportunity to define what we want to see uh, for ourselves in the future, and we have the opportunity to create our future by engaging in the right kinds of behaviors that move along uh, the strategies for your vision. And then finally, in this regard, it's important for you young men of color and for all of us in this room to be role models, mentors, and or sponsors for those uh, coming along behind us. That's important. And so um, I know many instances where there have been really good organizations on a university campus and then the president and vice president graduate, and then that group is lost, all right? And so whatever group you're in, we wanna make sure that you're providing for leadership succession by paying attention to mentoring and being role models and sponsors for those individuals. Um, so these are the sort of general themes uh, that I wanted to talk about as background, and I'm going to try to be uh, brief in my comments regarding my career. Uh, it's been 50 years, okay? <laughs> but, but I'm just gonna do this. I'll just tell you the positions I've held real quickly without discussing them, then I've got some ticketed points when I go over. Um, I actually started my career um, in higher education as assistant dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Washington University when I was starting my master's degree, okay? So that's why it's been 50 years and I'm still relatively young, right? <laughs> I was 23 at the time. Uh, it was highly unusual, but we'll, 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 we'll uh, get back to that. So I spent five years as assistant dean of arts and sciences, and then five years on the faculty in counseling psychology and African American studies, and two years part of that as chair of African American studies. Then I went to the University of California, Irvine, where I spent a couple of years as special assistant to the vice chancellor, and an opportunity came up where he wanted me to work with the dean of the medical school on their student affairs operations, which I did and I recommended to the dean how we ought to organize, staff, and fund student affairs in medical school. And then he, he asked me then if I would come over and do that while they do a national search. And so I did. They did the national search, and then they hired me <laughs> <laughs> as, as associate dean of, of the medical school for student and curricular affairs. And then um, the position of vice Chancellor for Student Affairs came up at Irvine, and uh, I was a candidate for that and was selected uh, following a national search. I was in that role for 11 years. I then went to Berkeley as the Vice Chancellor for Administration, uh, just under 10 years for that, and then here at CSUB for 14 years as president. See, 50 years in what? How many minutes? <laughs> But I want to just highlight a couple of things, and, and then certainly we want to get to the panel and the questions. I'm thinking about my pathways. One of the initial shocks that came to me uh, was in high school, because I thought I was in really good shape coming out of high school. I was a first-ranking student in my graduating class. I was president of the class. I had been student body president, and I was a letterman in football and wrestling. So I figured, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go. And, and the principal, who happened to be white, but with whom I had an excellent relationship, uh, came to me one day and said, you know, Monmouth College, which is a small college in Illinois, is recruiting black students. And, um, you know, I've, I've suggested a number of students that they might invite. And I was surprised by this because they said, but you know, I plan to go to Washington U. And then he said, well, you know, you've done very well here. 
Um, and you, certainly your first ranking student in your class. He says, everybody that goes to Washington U, you know, are high, high ranking students in their class. And then he went on to say, and they have had academic programs that are stronger than the academic programs that we have here. I'm going, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, are, are you telling me that I thought I was being prepared, but that, you know, I'm not getting the education that I thought I was getting? So what he said was, you've been a big fish in a small pond. I go, Ugh. You know, and so that was really deflating. He wasn't intending to be that way. He was simply being honest with me. So needless to say, I went on the trip to Monmouth College, and they showed, you know, showed us all around and told us why we should come and all that. But fortunately, um, I, I was awarded a scholarship to Washington University, uh, which is exactly what I wanted to do. All right? But, you know, that kind of message could have derailed me you know, very easily as a high school uh, senior. So, so I'm saying that was one of those instances. So, uh, as I said a couple of minutes ago, um, I went to, well, I, I went to Washington University, initially as pre-med, but then after a couple of years and after taking some psychology courses, I said, nah, I don't think I want to do pre-med, uh, pre I want to do psychology. And so I stayed at the university to finish a degree in uh, psychology. And then I was um, preparing to go to graduate school. And at this point, I was working full-time nights at McDonald Corporation. Barbara sometimes says, McDonald's. No, <laughs> it wasn't McDonald's. It was McDonald Aircraft Corporation. <laughs> um, and and this, uh, it was at that point in my senior year, the second go-round of working at McDonald, McDonald Aircraft, which became McDonald Douglas, which is now Boeing. But anyway, uh, at first, when I was there, I had finished high school and at mid-year, and Washington University didn't do any mid-year admission, so I had to wait for the fall. And so I immediately looked for a job, and so I got a job at McDonnell Douglas. And um, I did well and uh, taking calculus, and so I decided that when the fall came, I could just keep working full-time, you know, as a freshman. And by the time I got the first chemistry exam, it's like, mm, this is <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> And, and so um, I decided to not to continue working full time, started working part time, and, and that worked well, and it all worked out. Um, I'd also mention that um, here today also is um, the person who was our first lady here at CSUB for 14 years, but she's always been my first lady for now 52 years, oh, wow. Barbara Mitchell. So she is weaved in and out of <laughs> these circumstances and, and comments that I make. So again, I'll try to, I'll try to be fast here. Uh, so I became assistant dean of the College of Arts and Sciences while I was working in my PhD. Uh, and I stayed at Washington U to get the PhD. All right. And uh, I was at, I was working at McDonald, yeah, working at McDonnell Douglas when I got a call from my, one of my faculty members who said, I recommended you to the dean who's looking for two assistant deans of the College of Arts and Sciences. You know, that really puzzled me. I'm sitting at my desk at uh, McDonnell Douglas, and um, he was telling me about this, because this is something I never conceived of. Uh, my, imme immediately, my immediate thought was, well, the assistant dean that I've been working with is really old, like 70, you know. But 70 is a young age. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he nominated me for that, which I had not expected. And it goes back to my point of saying people are paying attention to you whether you know it or not. 
Okay. And so because of that, he made this recommendation. I met with the dean, had a good meeting, except then I didn't hear from him for several weeks. And he called me back to say, sorry, I had some surgery. I was out, but I want to talk to you again. So we talked again, and he offered me the position. So uh, I became assistant dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Washington U, which is a very distinguished university at a very early age. And so that was the start of my experience. There's so many stories, and I don't want to digress too much, but I'll just mention this. In the very first semester that I was in that role, um, there was an incident on campus where African-American students decided that they needed to take some action around police harassment of black students, okay? And what they did, actually, was to take over the police station, okay? And this was a big thing in St. Louis, and this was like in uh, the fall of uh, 1968. Yeah, and nothing big had happened in St. Louis. This was the biggest thing happening in St. Louis. And so there were several of us as uh, black administrators who were there talking to the students. And one by one, they threw, invited everybody to leave. You know, they allowed me to stay because, you know, I, had, I knew most of them because I was one of the students. And now I switched to this other role. And so at a point on television, the, the chancellor is asked about how the situation is going, and he says, it's going well. We have a black administrator in the group. Look. <laughs> you know, so then all the students look at me and say, okay, so why are you here? You know, we thought you were concerned about us and what we're doing. Now you're working for the chancellor. You know, which was not what it was all about, but, you know, it took a while to sort through that. So, but, but the fact that the chancellor said we have a black administrator in the group is as, as if I was some kind of spy, you know, doing things. So uh, that set me back a little bit, but, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we got past it. <laughs> we got past it. Um, and so, as I said again, I spent uh, five years on the faculty. Um, and then in 1978, uh, Barbara and I made the decision that we would move to the University of California, Irvine. And so I spent 17 years at UC Irvine. And um, one of the points that I made earlier about um, expanding your network and, 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 and the other part being known is that the campus needed someone to coordinate an information campaign on a proposition. And I volunteered to do that. And the reason I volunteered to do that is that the only person who really knew me on the campus was the person who hired me, the vice uh, chancellor for student affairs. And so um, they asked me to do that, and I did it, and it got me all over campus, meeting all sorts of people, and then all of a sudden people knew me uh, who, who didn't otherwise. And so that was important. And it's taking an opportunity and being proactive to say, hey, I can do that. All right, and there were good results out of that. And then the work with the dean at the medical school that I mentioned before. Now, interestingly, the dean um, led an effort on the part of the medical school faculty to censure the chancellor for withdrawing his support for the construction of a hospital on campus, okay? The dean leading a, an effort for the faculty to censure the chancellor. You know, that's not a good thing. <laughs> not a good thing. Uh, uh, and, and it didn't happen, and uh, things settled down a bit. And then this uh, vice chancellor for student affairs position came up, and then I was in the position of needing to decide, should I become a candidate? And my hesitation about it was that there were two people that I had reported to to that point at the university. It was the dean, who was trying to get rid of, censure the chancellor, and the other was the vice uh, chancellor for student affairs, who was actually being pushed out of that role for political reasons. 
And so I'm thinking, okay, uh, what are my chances, you know, given that these are the people uh, that I've, uh, you know, worked with and, and where they are in terms of the administrative structure. Uh, I made the decision that I would become a candidate. Um, and what was important to me, uh, and this is again about how we behave in the roles that we have, is that I always try to, on the one hand, be loyal to the dean or to the vice president, but not to go over into things that should not be something that I would advocate for. Okay, And so fortunately, the chancellor saw me as someone who was independent in my thinking and not inextric inextricably tied to the dean or the vice chancellor. That was really important. And so following the national search, I was appointed to that position. And as I said, I was there for, in that role for 11 years. Uh, very quickly, um, um, there was a, a, an outstanding person, Dr. Cheng Lin Tien, who was the first Asian American to head up a major American research university. And the only time he was not at Berkeley during his professional career was at, during two years when he was at Irvine as the executive vice chancellor. And he and I worked together uh, during those two years, and when the two years were up, he went back to Berkeley as the chancellor, all right? And then several years later, uh, there was a position that came up at Berkeley that he had someone inquire about whether or not that might be something that uh, I'd be interested in. And it was the position of vice uh, chancellor for business and administrative services, or chief business officer for the Berkeley campus. And so people were surprised when I didn't jump at the idea that the chancellor was interested in whether or not I would do this. And the point was that um, it was a change in role completely, all right, from student affairs, which is right on with psychologists and all of that, to the business side of things where I'd be supervising accounts payable and payroll and police and parking and people's park and uh, you name it. <laughs> but also uh, athletics was a part of that. And so... Um, when I met with the chancellor, uh, just talking on the phone, he said, I said, I'm not sure that this is something that I want to do. And so he says, well, you know, of the 2,000 people that will be reporting to you in this role, half of them are in units that you used to manage, uh, that you do manage at Irvine, and for half of them, you were a customer. And uh, I think you'd be great in this role. And I had not thought about it. And so uh, I said to him, I appreciate your interest. However, um, I always want to go someplace where I can make a difference in what's going on. I said, and Berkeley is already number one, and I can't imagine what I can do to enhance that. What he said was, yes, Berkeley is number one academically, but I fear that we're losing the administrative capacity to support Berkeley's academic mission, okay? That became a whole different thing. If I could do something to help support Berkeley's academic mission, that would be important, okay? And so uh, um, he said, why don't you come visit me? And he said, and bring Barbara. <laughs> uh, that was because Barbara and I had a great relationship with him and his wife uh, and um, he figures he can convince her as part of convincing me <laughs> to do this. And, and it worked well, and it worked well. And, and we, we went, uh, see, uh, and, and we went as a couple, and, and so I became vice chancellor, and she became uh, an advisor in the College of Letters and Science. All right, so it worked out uh, really well. So, uh, a lot more I can talk about, but we're out of time. Uh, but uh, needless to say, I have uh, enjoyed uh, the time that I've spent. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, being uh, vice chancellor uh, at Irvine and uh, at Berkeley, and I particularly enjoy being president here at CSUB. 
So I want to end, uh, before we get to questions and other comments, with a uh, poem that many of you have heard before and which uh, is in very small font, so I'm going to have to look closely. Um, it's, the title of the poem is Mother to Son. It's a poem by Langston Hughes. How many of you have heard this poem before? Okay, a number of people have. All right. It, this is the poem. It says, well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It has tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places where no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I have been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going into the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Uh, don't you set down on the steps cause you uh, find it kind of hard. Don't you fall now. For all, for, I'm sorry, for eyes still a climbing, still reaching landings, and life for me Ain't been no crystal stair. All right? And so uh, that's part of the message we want to create and to say to you that for most of us, uh, life has not been a crystal stair, and it might not have been that for you either, but we want you to make sure that you think about how it is that you can create the future that you want and plan a strategy to get that done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell, for that pathway to success. I think we all got a lot of jewels uh, from that presentation. We're now going to turn to our panelists, and I will begin with Dr. Chris Krishnan, Assistant Vice President, Office of Institutional Research, Planning, and Assessment. Dr. Krishnan is the Assistant Vice President for Institutional Research, Planning, and Assessment, he has over 20 years of experience leading institutional research offices in colleges and universities at state higher educational agencies. His current research interest spans a number of areas, including the examination of factors and policies that help students succeed in college and at the college experience and outcomes for low socioeconomic status, underrepresented, and first-generation students. Next to him, we have Faust Gorman, Associate Vice President and Chief Information Officer. Faust is an information technology leader with passion for innovation, transformation, service, and technology. He brings over 20 years of professional IT experience in both the public and private sector serving also as co-chair of the Latina Latino Faculty and Staff Association. Faust is a strong student success advocate. Next, we have Coach Rod Barnes, head men's basketball coach. Coach Barnes is entering his eighth season as CSUB's head men's basketball coach. An accomplished coach and collegiate player, Coach Barnes has led the runners to their best NCAA Division I record at 24 and 9. Coach, I see these guys looking like we're going to do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> he has also led the runners to WAC Tournament Championship in their first NCAA tournament appearance. Among his many coaching accolades, Coach Barnes has been named Naismith National Coach of the Year, SEC Coach of the Year. Don Haskins Coach of the Year, Independent Coach of the Year, and Hugh Durham Coach of the Year. How many years, Coach? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
a graduate of Ole Miss, Coach Barnes and his wife Bridget have three sons, Brandon, Bray, and Corey. Next, we have Dr. Mark Martinez, Professor and Chair of Political Science. Dr. Martinez is Professor and Chair of Political Science, CSU Bakersfield. He earned his BA in Political Science from California State University, Chico, and his MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Professor Martinez's book, The Myth of Free Market, The Role of the State in Capitalist Economy, reviews state market relations, analyzes the forces behind the 2008 market meltdown, and won praise from a wide range of economists and public policy experts alike. Dr. Martinez has published peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, served as a professional reviewer for the academic journals and professional editing houses, and has presented his research at professional conferences across the United States, Mexico, and Asia. Professor Martinez is currently co-director of CSUB's Center for Social Justice. He does regular commentary for various media outlets, has hosted and produced several radio programs in Bakersfield, and is a regular political analyst for Kern County's number one news source, KGET TV 17 News. I'm sure they like that free PSA. <laughs> Professor Martinez has two kids, Monica, 20, Sebastian, 18, and is married to Wendy Avila. And our fifth panelist is Dr. Vernon Hopper, Associate Vice President for Academic Programs. He is inspired to be a part of CSUB's continued growth because of his committed student body, rich diversity, and dedication to the overall development of each and every student. I'm going to repeat that, Dr. Harper, and I know you want me to. <laughs> to each and every student. He holds a PhD in human communication from Howard University. His proudest achievements are his family and bringing people together for systemic solutions that create value to the community we serve. Please welcome our panelists. If you are joining us via live stream, please type your questions into the comments section. And the first question that I have, and these questions as we ask them, you may answer all of you in no particular order or those who feel the need or would like to answer the questions, please do so. Dr. Mitchell shared with us his pathway to success. Briefly describe your pathway to success. Not all at the same time. <laughs> I'll, I'll take this first, I, and I'll be brief. Um, one of the things that I, I, I see when I go to conferences are our symposiums is that people uh, always get people saying, uh, you know what you want to do, have a pathway, et cetera, and that's nice. But I, I want to let everybody here know that, and especially the students and the, the guys here on the team, yeah, I had no clue what I was going to do. I was telling everybody here on the panel earlier that, uh, that I, my, my first degree was uh, an associate's degree in fire science. And the reason why I got an associate's degree in fire science was because I knew that I did not want to get a regular job working nine to five. So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is that you don't necessarily know, have to know what you want to do as long as you know what you don't want to do. And if you know what you don't want to do, find positions and jobs and careers that are going to take you in a different path. And I knew if I was going to become a fireman that I wasn't going to be working nine to five. They have a much different schedule, et cetera, et cetera. So I, if we're going to talk about careers, yeah, it's great to know. And if you do have that kind of discipline and, and mindset, and if you know what you're doing, that's great. But if you're not entirely sure, come and see me, Department of Political Science. I'll get you on the right path. But more importantly, as long as you know what you don't want to do, that's also a big step. And so I'll leave it with that. Well, uh, let me give you a little insight of my path. It wasn't linear at all, you know. 
it was totally, I mean, I could, to this day, I can't describe to my, uh, my uh, children what I'm doing. They don't understand what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, when I started uh, in, in elementary and secondary schools, I wasn't ready for school. I, I was someone who was disruptive in a sense, and one day I climbed out the window, jumped out of the school window, and the supervisor caught me, and they, they sent me home saying that don't bring a child to school anymore. <laughs> so that really set me off because my mom was crying. That, that is a defining moment for me, and he said that's when I started constructing the identity, what I should be and what I sh shouldn't be. And that set me in the path. In the past, we, I mean, normally we don't sit on the dining table, talk about photosynthesis or uh, programming a robot, learning, but this is something that we started talking to my siblings, and then we got interested, and things developed. So I was the first in my family to go to college. That set the path for others following me. And th th that was, uh, well, that, then going, living, doing my master's degree, I didn't have enough money, then I have to go out to work before I have enough money to come start, do my graduate studies. So, but have this identity construction in you. Be, as, as Dr. Mitchell say, aware of what you want to do and construct the identity that where you want to be and that will lead you, despite the fact that you may have disruptions along your path. So I didn't have a linear path to go to grad school and grad school because I had to go out and work again. And it took me another 10 years to go back and do my doctoral degree. So don't give up. Stay, stay on your track and set your sights and reach, reach there. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a slightly different picture. From a, from a very young age, there were two things that I knew exactly what I was going to do. My identity was set. I was going to be an aeronautical engineer and I was going to be a professional trumpet player. <laughs> Neither of those two things happened. <laughs> okay. one, one lasted till I was about 17, professional trumpet player. Then I realized um, you can't make very much money with the quality of skills that I had, right? <laughs> Regardless of how much I wanted to work for that. And aeronautical engineer lasted till like my sophomore year in college when I realized I did not have the preparation, nor did I have the discipline or the uh, uh, ability to reach out and, and ask for help. So I'm kind of that, I'm kind of that uh, student who is the example of what you really don't want to be, right? I didn't go to see my advisors. I didn't uh, find student peer groups or support groups. I didn't go and speak to my professors. I did none of that, right? And so guess what? Um, you know, here I was at UC Davis and I got expelled, right? So then I had to fight back after a while of figuring out what I really did want to do Right? And then going in and actually talking to people and saying, here's why you need to give me another chance. And, and that's why I'm in front of you today is because of that, I call it perseverance or, or will, and finally figuring out what that identity is or who I really wanted to be and then also where I was good. You know, what I actually had uh, decent skills and, and passion for, you know, which is essentially applying technology toward higher education to help make our institutions better. Right? That, that really is what drives me, right? to help give people the opportunity to access data, information, knowledge, anything you need to be able to get to what you want, right? Um, which is hopefully careers, families, everything else, right? Um, so that's, uh, that was my journey. Oh, coach. I was getting the eye to say something, so I better come up with something. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll, I'll just, speak very briefly, not about my path, but what I believe to be uh, uh, how you should view your paths and the path. Um, and a particular quote that's been particularly resonant for me for the last 10 or so years uh, came from um, Steve Jobs, and it was uh, paraphrasing it, but if you, if you sit down and you try to plan your life by like putting dots, and uh, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, and for people like me, or, and I know there's a lot of academics out there like me, we share this same affliction to just sort of plan your life through these dots. And Steve Jobs says that's a complete waste of time. Um, and it's taken me quite a while to recognize that that's a waste of time and in that that I've spent so much time doing it throughout my life and to, be, to realize that it had no material value. And what Steve was trying to say was that the only dot that you can focus on is the next one. 
because once you cannot see the doors that will open after that dot. Um, Dr. Mitchell, life, and all the lives of the individuals up on their stage are, exemplify that in terms of um, he did not know that when he took that particular role that that door for the assi assistant dean would open and that would open so many doors in his career. I did a presentation once in Virginia at the State Council for Higher Education and I was offered a job six months later that changed my whole career. No way to know that those, how those dots are gonna be connected into the future. So my advice, very, very simply and succinctly, is to focus on the next thing that you wanna do and to do that thing, to make that jump as well as you possibly can. Yes, uh, I think my pathway uh, to success has a lot to do with Dr. Martinez as he spoke. Uh, I started off as a young man working in the cotton fields and soybean fields and I knew what I didn't want to continue to do. <laughs> so that was a motivate, motivating factor to me each and every year not to go back to the fields. So it, uh, it really inspired me to get a college education. And when we started talking, I think my family, my mom and dad, uh, started the identity uh, construction for me of who I am. That's where I started, to find out who I am. And as Dr. Mitchell spoke about that, and who, who do I say that I am? Am I that person? And no matter what field I in, I kind of started off in computer science because in the 80s that was the thing. So I was going to be a computer science major. We were going to do some programming. I was going to make a lot of money and I wouldn't have to go back to the fields. And as I continued to uh, study at Ole Miss, I realized after those hard practices, staying in the lab to one or two o'clock in the morning, that computer science was not for me. <laughs> so I decided to make a decision that uh, I would choose another uh, path, uh, career path, and I went into business management because I always wanted to own my own business. But probably after my sophomore year, uh, being selected as a captain of the team, uh, I started to see the impact I was having on other players, uh, where I, after being the captain, uh, a lot of the guys looked up to me and, and they thought that, you know, things I had in my life all right and all correct at the time, which if they only knew, uh, I was guessing and wondering and hoping and dreaming uh, that things would work out. Uh, but back then, I think the biggest thing for me uh, was that I stayed hold to what uh, my family, uh, my mom and dad, had placed inside of me. And through that path, I thought I would be successful because I knew who I, who I was and who I am, uh, regardless of what field, uh, regardless of what career path I would take. I had to write things that had been instilled inside of me to be successful in any area, any uh, business, or any career path I would have chosen. Thank you. If you could relive your days as a college student, going back to your time as a freshman, how would you approach life as a college student? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll take that one too. Um, I, I would have been a lot more serious. Uh, so, so keep in mind when I, uh, when I got my associate's degree in fire science and I thought I was going to become a fireman, um, I, I literally started off to get an, a, a, a technical degree, and I forget what they're called, but uh, it wasn't until I had a, a, um, a, a couple of fire chiefs tell me, and they saw something to me because they were teaching the classes that I was taking, and they said, you know, if you get a general education degree, if you take the biology and history and political science classes, you'll get an associate's degree and you'll climb in the system much faster. And all I heard was you'll make more money faster than everybody else. And so I said, okay, good. So I got an associate's degree. Well, so that was great. But then they said, you know, Mark, if, now that you have an associate's degree in fire science, if you get a bachelor's degree, you'll climb even faster. So I went to Chico State. You've heard of Chico State, right? Everything you've heard is true. So I really didn't go with the idea of being an academic, but here's the other thing. You want to apply yourself. Whatever you're doing, do it as best you can. And as it turns out, I got noticed. 
And uh, pr uh, President Mitchell mentioned about people are always watching. People are noticing. And then the first person who told me, you should go to graduate school, I said, what the hell is that? I had no clue what graduate school was. I had no clue what a PhD, I just knew you had professors. And so, and so what I'm telling you guys, and those of you that are, are, are undergraduates, you know, you don't have to necessarily know what you're doing. Just know that you don't want to be where you're at or where you see other people you don't like hanging out. And so, again, I don't see any of you guys in my political science department. I'm going to see a couple of you guys. And so I know some of you who haven't decided your majors, um, come and see me. If you want a double major, politics, and I'm, I, this, you, that's what I'm doing. So I, I, I can see a couple of people here. So, all right. So, I'll, so I would have been more serious because there were a couple of things. And here's the other thing: go talk to your professors because one thing I never did was never went to go talk to any of my professors. And I still remember to this day when I went to go do the stuff to apply for graduation, and and the department chair was the former. Uh, uh, chief of staff for the fair, first uh, Governor Brown administration. And he, was, he looked at me, and he had this stern, fatherly, grandfather look, and he just said, you've never been in here. And I said, yeah, I know, but I figured it out. Just sign it. And I know that was rude, but I just, that's the way I was. And he just looked at me. And I didn't think he was going to sign it, but I think he didn't want to talk to me. So he just signed it, and I graduated. But the point is, I would have got a lot more out of my education if I was more serious, and more importantly, if I had went to go talk to my professors. And so, come and see me. So those of you who don't have a major, come and see me. Even if you can be biology, I'll direct you to biology. I just want to say one thing, and I hope this is recorded for eternity online. Uh, uh, I went to Penn State. And uh, I wouldn't change one day of my time at Penn State. And don't change any of yours. Enjoy yourselves, study hard, but enjoy yourself. OK, let's move I, on. I had a blast at Chico, and I wouldn't change any time there. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's move on to the next question. When you faced obstacles to success, as a college student, what is it that gave you the determination not to give up? I, I think for me it was my, my mom. My mom was always back there just constantly asking, like, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Have you taken care of this? How about now moving forward? So I think it was her in my corner always championing, right, always helping me through that next obstacle that I had. And, uh, and, and I think much of what I've accomplished is thanks to her. I would probably say three things. Uh, the, my professors, uh, when I struggled uh, in the classes, was really there for me. Uh, my mom and my dad both were there for me. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, um, a pack, if you want to call it, or friendship uh, with a player. Uh, each year I developed to, uh, we made a pack with each other that we would never uh, let the other one uh, not do their best. So every, whether it was class or whether it was on the court or off the court, uh, we made a pact with each other because uh, we all wanted to be successful. So we would choose, we, I would just basically choose to, hey, let's, let's make this pact that we won't let each other down this year. And you know, after four years, I was able to graduate and uh, overcome those adversities or those obstacles. Coach Bonds, I kind of made a pact to myself that whatever obstacles that I came across, I'm going to overcome this. And uh, as a result, then, you know, my parents were kind of my guardians for this, and I used to call them up and have a discussion with them. But have it resolve in you that these obstacles are temporary. They, they're going to go away, you know. Nothing can stop you. If you have that kind of a mindset, these obstacles will well, you'll be relieved of these obstacles. So stay on your course, decide what you want to do, and go ahead. And answering the previous question, I mean, you have four years as, a, as, a, as an undergraduate at the university. You've got to be merry, enjoy yourself, but get involved, as, 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 Do, as Dr. Mitchell said. Be proactive, get involved, get to know the people, you get network yourself. And that will bear a lot of fruits down the line. Okay. At what point in life did you realize the value of a quality education 
And was there someone or something that helped you to realize that? I think I, I will answer that real quickly. Uh, the first day I set foot on the University of Mississippi campus, and I saw all the, the cars and all the nice things that people had, I said, this is probably where I need to be. <laughs> so. Uh, when you leave the fields two weeks before that and then you show up and you see all of these things with people that were the same age, I said, I could get used to this. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell, you mind answering that one? Okay. At what point in life did you realize the value of a quality education? And was there someone or something that helped you to realize it? Um, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I would say that uh, I always felt, uh, in, even in high school, that the college was really very important. And uh, as I said, I identified Washington University as the place that I wanted to go. And I understood that in order to be able to do that, I really had to work hard and be focused on, on what I wanted to do. And um, once I was there, uh, I found very supportive faculty and staff who encouraged me to do things. Uh, for example, um, once I decided uh, not to continue with pre-med and to get a degree in psychology, um, several of the faculty members said, you know, you ought to go ahead and get a master's degree as well, which I had not thought about doing, okay? And then once I was into the master's degree, it became very clear that the next thing was to get the PhD, all right? And because there were people there who were encouraging me to do that and people who would be, who would be the faculty members for me in those programs. And so, um, so I sort of knew it from the beginning, but it became clearer and clearer as I moved up. Now, also, and this is related to, to some of the things we've said before, one of the things I recognized is that, in fact, administrators got higher pay than faculty members, okay, um, in, in many places, all right? And so I decided that I probably want to spend more time being an administrator than being a straight faculty member. And, uh, you know, over the last uh, 40 years or so, it's all been uh, higher administration. Okay. Well, Dr. Mitchell, I have a question for you. I know I've heard you say many times that you changed major from a pre-med to a psychology. Mm -hmm. Did you graduate in four years? Because I did. Of, well, great. Yeah, yeah. You're trying to push our students <laughs> to graduate in four years. <laughs> Fifteen to finish. That's our mantra here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Who are the mentors that you have had and why are they considered mentors? And I add to that, I had written this question before Dr. Mitchell made his presentation. He also added sponsors. So I will say mentors and sponsors. I'll go a couple of people and they aren't involved in education. One is my dad, um, similar story to Coach Barnes. Uh, he was 21 years old, had three kids looking out in the fields. He was working in the fields, and he just said it was the coldest day in July over in Kings County, and he said um, he just knew what he never wanted to do, and that was to live his life working in the fields and having no options. Uh, he always talked about the importance of an education. My grandfather um, came from Mexico, didn't get a day of education. His dad would force him out in the fields. Uh, they'd do all the work, he'd get all the money, he was a drunk, alcoholic, etc. Not a good guy, uh, a lot of bad stories there. But one of the things he always encouraged was to get an education. He didn't know what a master, like me, master's, PhD, etc., etc. But when he passed, um, he had cancer. He was one of these guys, just very unlucky in life in the sense that uh, he couldn't speak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one thing, when I went to go see him when he was on his deathbed, and he couldn't speak because he had tubes and he had cancer of the throat, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I got in, he walked into his room, he, was, he tried to sit up and he had, a, he had a pen and a pencil, a paper on, on the side of his bed and he reached for it and I got it for him. And he wrote, 
Two letters, and that was it. What did he write? This is when I was in graduate school. What were those two letters? DR, doctor. And so here's a guy who was on his deathbed, and he was in tremendous pain, cancer, eating him up, and the only thing he could think of was me finishing my PhD. And so when I think of mentors and inspirations, I think about my dad being out in that field. Uh, I think about my grandfather. And so, and all of you have grandfathers or people in your family, like my, my Papa Chewy, and you don't know who they are, but they're rooting for you. And um, yeah, come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pitching. <laughs> So as I as I mentioned, you know, when I when I dropped out um, from UC Davis, I was I was struggling. I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do, and I ran into a professor. His name was Dr. Bay Butler, uh, part of Agricultural and Resource Economics, and he taught um, a, a managerial economics course. And it was that course that convinced me to really try to fight back and know that aeronautical engineering was not the way I was going to go. But instead, you know, everything through the business side of the house was really. Uh, what was starting to draw me in, right? So business, technology, management, all that. And, and he was really my inspiration to go back, fight, get back in, and then graduate. Well, in my case, uh, as I mentioned, my mom was my primary mentor in the sense that she gave me all the fortitude to go ahead and do what, what I should do. And she I was unable to read and write in English, but she spoke in our native language, but we ended up teaching her English and that, you know, she, she was my inspiration. And in high school, I had a, a, a teacher who really set us in the right course. And he said, you, you should ins aspire to do, your, uh, do a bachelor's degree, do a master's degree, and perhaps be a professional. And that set us in the path that, we, that this is something that is achievable for me and achievable for anyone here. I would say I've had four or five mentors. Uh, probably the first starting with Rob Evans, who hired me at the University of Mississippi. Uh, next, we would see Dr. Wallace, who's here, who's uh, probably been in my life as a mentor longer than anyone. Uh, my dad, of course, uh, and then Dr. Mitchell uh, being the other one uh, that have really impacted my life. So. Um, uh, mentors, uh, counselors, sponsors, certainly my parents, uh, uh, God bless them. Uh, my wife, who's uh, held my head when I've been crying and give me all the encouragement in the world. Uh, professionally, I would certainly say uh, Dr. Uh, Ronald Verrett, who's president of Xavier, Louisiana. President, former President Tim Gilmore of Wilkes University and uh, Provost Linda Lamwers of uh, Westchester University. Great, thank you. In Arthur Ashe's book, Days of Grace, he had a section where he talked about his wish for the world. What is your wish for the world? Uh, <clears throat> I'll start and uh, I was debating about whether or not to be political here or not. <laughs> um, You're retired. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, um, I wish uh, we had. Oh, wait, this is being recorded, right? <laughs> well, uh, I, I wish that there that people could come together and uh, realize that we're all one and to think about how it is that we can live together and work together uh, more effectively than what we've done before. And that's, that's an overarching kind of thought. And um, just uh, would hope that uh, the world would be as one, I think a commercial says, yeah. something like that. I totally agree, and that's, uh, I mean, Dr. Mitchell took the words out of my mouth, and that's what we want to have, a equity and equality, as well as opportunity for everyone to grow and reach their potential. Right. 
my, my children. My children are six and three, um, that they can grow up into a world that accepts them for who they are, that you know, where they have all the opportunity that uh, they deserve based on you know, their, their merits and ability to accomplish things, and uh, where they're uh, safe and loved, and I think that would be fantastic. Well, uh, uh, since we got the students, are you guys all first generation, first ones go to college? I imagine a good number of you are. No? No, you guys? Oh, good. We got some. All right. Good legacy people. A couple of you. Okay. Well, and it really, that, that, that's just part of the, what I was going to uh, talk about. We're talking about our world. We're talking about Cal State University, Bakersfield. We're talking about our students. And I, and I think about this when I talk to some of our students, some of my students, is that if you think about your ancestors and what they dreamed of and what they wanted for you, their kids, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, uh, my dream for you guys to know that you're exactly where your ancestors wanted you to be. They wanted you to be in a place that, that, that you could make something of yourself. I know you guys got great basketball talent. I wish I had some athletic talent but didn't have any of that but I knew when I was at the university that finally that that uh, when I finally got it um, you guys have a nice opportunity and you guys have not just a nice opportunity but you have an obligation I be I believe to those who came before you and helped set you up to be where you're at today and so just kind of I just think about that dr. Harper we're not gonna let you all uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I struggle, as uh, Horace mentioned, to stay as apolitical as possible. Um, but uh, being mindful of that, I, I think that what um, I would only wish that um, higher education continues to be a unifying force in our society. Um, that it's really meant to be. Okay. Coach Barnes? Could I pass on this particular question to <laughs> Dr. Wallace? I'm not sure I, your players I, want I, you to I'm pass not, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm not as uh, experienced or wise as Dr. Mitchell, so I, I would like to pass on this particular <laughs> question. <laughs> If you could give me a mulligan this time, please. <laughs> you have it. Okay, okay, I'm now to the cards, and uh, just reading this one, I'm making an assumption that this is from a student. So it says, uh, if I'm looking to choose a mate or a partner, what traits should I look for? <laughs> may, may I ask who? What question? Who? Who can, Where did that question come from? Hmm? You want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> if I'm looking to choose a mate or a partner, what traits should I look for? All right. <clears throat> I'll start it off. <laughs> Uh, as I said, uh, Mrs. Mitchell and I have been married for 52 years, fair, fair amount of time. And, um, you know, I get asked from time to time questions related to this, though, though not quite the same, about um, what does it take to be married that long, you know. And uh, first of all, and, and this relates to your question more directly, I think you have to find somebody who you believe is your soulmate, Okay. Somebody who can be your soulmate. And what I mean by that is somebody that you can see and talk to and know that uh, he or she um, is someone who wants to go in the same direction that you want to go in. Um, and I always talk about the importance for couples to have a shared vision for the future. And um, I think if you can find somebody uh, who you feel that way about, then you're on the right track. Anyone else? The question is kind of out of my league. When I, when I first met my wife and I said, she's my partner, she's the one, and that's it. 
you know. But um, looking at people, I tend to look at it, you know, assessing people. You, I, since been from a statistical background, I look at probability and <laughs> chances and all that. That, that, that. that leads to a, not to a good background, so I tend to stay out of this. <laughs> so I've coded this application that, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think uh, drive, somebody who is uh, very driven, as, as driven as you are, shares the same values. Um, you know, I, I, for, for me, you know, and this is where it gets very personal, so it's hard to give that type of advice. Um, you know, fam, family, fam, very family oriented, right? And, and much, much smarter than me. That's, that's it. That's. <laughs> um, I would say the first thing, uh, is someone who could give and receive love. Um, because I think love can overcome a lot, not infatuation or uh, physical, uh, as I'm talking to the players now, but uh, <laughs> someone who you really could uh, share your life with, have the same values. I think that starts with knowing who you are to have someone compatible. Uh, I would also say someone who makes you better. Uh, as teammates, uh, soulmates, as Dr. Mitchell said, someone who each and every day uh, challenges you to get better, but also is willing to give you constructive criticism, uh, but love you at the same time. Uh, so uh, in those, uh, traits of love, uh, it's many of those, whether it's long-suffering or patient or kindness, uh, but you have to know who you are uh, to know what kind of wife or mate that you, uh, or soulmate uh, that you would take as your partner or your mate. So uh, to me, that is uh, super important because if you don't know who you are, how do you know what you want or what you need? Uh, unfortunately, this this trait isn't um, apparent. It only reveals itself over time. So that's the inherent risk of any relationship uh, from this perspective. And um, Rod mentioned it, and uh, I think most important, one of the most important traits is you find a person that's patient with you. And your ability to be patient with them is critical. I met my wife of 18 years. I'm not at 52 yet, but we're working on it. You uh, have to get there first. You have to get there first. <laughs> and um, I, I met my wife on, uh, I'm doing this for her benefit because I'm going to show it to her tonight. Um, <laughs> on uh, July 17th, 1999, and we sat on a uh, blanket uh, left of the Lincoln Memorial, right next to the Potomac in Washington, D.C. And uh, she told me she wanted to have three kids. And I said in my mind, I says, I'm not having three kids, but you sure are cute. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and she knew what she wanted. And I have three kids. <laughs> and so um, uh, she was patient with me and waited for me to come along. And uh, I think if you find somebody that's patient with you, you'll be okay. Thank you. Well, let me finish since everybody else went. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to synopsize. You need somebody you can grow with. Uh, somebody that um, I think, and that's the soulmate thing, but somebody that, that actually can grow. Somebody who's not going to be stuck in the same wheelhouse. And then I think the other thing is, is that mutual respect thing. You have to find somebody that's smarter than you. And so, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people are, are, are in situations where they don't like to be put in bad. Uh, they, they don't want to have their, their bad habits pointed out or some of the things that they're doing. Find somebody who's smarter than you, somebody that's patient with you, and I think, uh, um, and somebody you can grow with. I think that's pretty, that's pr probably what everybody's looking for and probably the best we can all hope for. Great. In support of creating pathways to success for young males of color, 
what do you feel are one or two key things we should do in a support role? In support of creating pathways to success for young males of color, what do you feel are one or two key things we should do in a support role? I'll start. I, uh, getting back to what uh, Coach Barnes just said, part of it is helping uh, young males of color to understand who they are. Uh, and who they want to be, and whether or not they are prepared to do the things that are necessary to become the person that they want to be, right? And by that, I'm meaning uh, in the future. You might be comfortable with where you are right now and with what you're doing, but it could very well be that you realize that you need to be uh, at a different place later on in order to be all that you can be. All right, I'll move on to the next card. What advice could you give us that you wish someone had given you when you were younger? And then there's a second part to this. Uh, it says, be honest. If you did not get paid for what you do, would you still do it? You know, with a billion, billion and a half dollars in the lottery... My wife brought some tickets the other night, and, and I said, you know, if we win, I'm still teaching. So, yeah. Uh, buy, buy Apple stock when it was $16. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's what I wish somebody would have told me. Uh, that's, uh, and, and, yes, I would continue to, I would continue to work in, in higher education, and I would continue to do what I want. One of the things about technology is the private sector, you know, pays two, three times more what we do in higher education. But the mission of what we're here to do is that, that important. I, and it's what drives me internally and why I stay. Yeah. I understand money is necessary for our living and our sustenance, but uh, you know, when you get a passion to do something you, you, and love what you're doing, you will really enjoy what you're doing. That's, that'll be the path that I would choose. I started as an engineer but ended up in higher ed. And if I had stayed an engineer, I probably would have made more money, but you know, looking back, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I really enjoy being here with the university, with seeing the students, meeting the faculty. That's a real joy. Great. Okay, next one. There's not a widely agreed upon definition of what a leader is or should be, but what is a trait that a young man of color should have or cultivate in order to be a great leader? I'll start, <clears throat> and uh, it gets back to some of the things that I was saying before, and that is that it's really important for young men of color to develop your leadership skills. And I said before that listening is a big part of that. Uh, sometimes we want to talk, but we need to make sure that if we're going to be a leader, we need to understand what people are saying about what their needs are because the leader is concerned not only about his or her individual needs, but what are the needs of the group that you are representing, okay? And so having good listening skills and being able to help people um, work through uh, discord, you know, listen well enough that you can pull out some gems from one person and share that in such a way that there is greater understanding than there would have been had you not been in the conversation. Okay. How would you view the role of women of color and women generally in the mentorship of young men of color? Well, in, in, my, in my comments, uh, I said that um, young men of color should have access to, um, you know, men of color and other sponsors and mentors and uh, role models. 
And so I think that it, it ultimately, um, a person who has your best interest in mind, who wants to facilitate what you're doing and is honest about that, doesn't matter, you know, uh, what their uh, ethnicity is or even what their gender is, as long as they are prepared to be genuinely supportive of what you're wanting to do. Okay, there are two left here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's so important uh, because I think the role of females, uh, especially during this season and time where we are, uh, we need that kind of nurturing uh, uh, from females as we have a group of women that surround our uh, men's basketball team and they're very supportive of them that call women of team believe and they spend time with them uh, because I think uh, the role of uh, women in, in a male's life uh, to be able to speak uh, into their lives and to them as mentors, as men, and they just ask the question about a soulmate to see someone uh, regardless of color uh, that has accomplished or been through a lot to be able to explain that from a different view than, say, of males that have been in their lives all the time is very impactful. Uh, some of the women that are not even my mother that have spoken in my life or the way that they have carried themselves, uh, uh, the way that they go about uh, their lifestyle has impacted my life uh, to the point uh, that I saw it different. Uh, and I will say this out of, uh, and I talked about our, my mentor being Dr. Wallace and Dr. Mitchell and their wives uh, in the way that they care of themselves has impacted me to help, be able to help my wife, but also to encourage me what class, uh, what integrity, what transparency, uh, what is desire or what is inspirational seeing it from someone that is not of the same gender that I am. Let me, let me actually address that a little bit as well. For, um, my daughter is the first uh, female in, in our family, and uh, whether on my ex-wife's side or on my dad's side, uh, where she has not had any role ascribed to her. She can't make tortillas. She can't make tacos. She can't. And this is because since day one, I've always told her, you're going to be who you want to be, not what society tells you you should be. And so and when I think about um, the role women play and women of color, um, I, I think part of that, and I don't know if I'm going to answer this right, but, but that also means that males need to kind of change what they expect and and. and and look at the world a little bit more differently than what we see on television, what we've seen in our past. And so uh, my daughter, she can't cook with beans. She can't do anything uh, when it comes to the kitchen. But she doesn't care about that. Some people do, and that's fine. Some of you guys might be great. But the thing is, is that um, she's the first one. And, and this is in a very macho family environment. I, again, all of her grandparents are from Mexico, et cetera. And... Um, and she's a much better person for it, and so is my son. Uh, my son doesn't wait for anybody to do anything. He cooks, he cleans, et cetera. So do I. And so I think when we're thinking, well, you know where I'm going on that. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Can I address this too? I'll confine my uh, statements to the uh, college environment. You know, if you look around, see the girls are doing much better than the boys in our college environment because they're so organized, so focused in what they want to do. I'm always tracking the graduation retention rates. I can see our females are doing much better than, than, the, than the males. And I wonder, why, why don't these guys follow the girls' example? Why don't they do exactly what they do? Why can't they learn from them? You know, when I see a gap, I wonder, is, did my guys let me down again? So the, the girls are doing much better. So they have a lot to teach us on how to navigate this uh, college environment. So we need them as partners. Okay. What advice do, do, do you give young men of color when they live in a non-diverse community? How do we survive? How do we succeed? I'll start this one. 
Um, when our kids were growing up, uh, we lived in Irvine. And the black population uh, in Irvine was about 2%. All right? And, um, you know, the kids had issues in terms of, you know, why do I have to go to this school and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, they were always successful in what they were doing, but they regretted not having a more diverse uh, environment. Uh, this is when they were, they were uh, growing up. And in that regard, when our son uh, got to the age of being able to drive, uh, I was very specific in talking to him in particular about um, any contact or encounters with the police. All right? I said, um, you know, you might be stopped for some reason that you might consider not valid. You know, they might say, well, your signal light was out or this or that or the other. Okay, I said, do not argue with them. Do not give them a reason to say you are resisting arrest or something like that that creates other problems. I said, if they have done something inappropriate, we will make sure that we follow up with our attorney, but we don't want you out you know, at night in some confrontation. And um, I, I think he, he learned that right away and never had problems. When you were in college, how did you handle adversity? I think we had a question like that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, here's the last one. What can be done to create more safe spaces for young men of color on CSU grounds? Just what does a safe space for young men of color entail? My thought of that is that the whole campus should be a safe space. You know, um, uh, sometimes people restrict themselves to certain areas. Well, this is where I'm, I'm comfortable. This is where I want to be. Um, that's okay to a point. But if it means that they're excluding the opportunity to have other experiences, then I see that as a problem. All right? And so uh, I would want young men of color to feel very comfortable anywhere on the campus feeling that, quote, this is my campus, you know, and I have a right to be anywhere I want to be at any point in time. And, and to, to follow up on that, I mean, I think if there's, a, if there's a feeling like there isn't or there are parts that aren't, I think, you know, getting that to, to, to Dr. Wallace would be very, very important because mm -hmm. I think those are the things we just want to uh, address completely outright. Will all of you join me in saying how much we appreciate uh, these men of color? I didn't say young men. Uh, <laughs> how much we appreciate these men of color in sharing their wisdom and talents with us? Thank all of you for being here. Thank you.